really summarizing it is a lot of what space has to do with water is that it gives you information that you can make decisions on and act on relevant to water resources management. Um, <clears throat> and I think that's it. So we're going to talk a lot about that today. And I really want it to be an engaging dialogue with all of you because I know we have some experts in the room, actually, and we have some non-experts or, or people that are less familiar. So want this to be a dialogue. Um, and by way, I guess maybe first I can also introduce myself. You might be confused. I was up on the stage speaking about um, water a lot. Uh, so I'm a hydrologist. I, I uh, started out doing, you know, really interested in solving uh, problems around water resources, a lot around extreme events and how that impacts societies and people, and how that impacts the things that we rely on, like forests, food, um, looking at coastal areas. But what I realized is that I was doing a lot of work in places where there wasn't a lot of data on the ground. And it troubled me because I also realized that really big decisions were being made. For example, I was doing some work with UN Environment Program and the World Bank. I realized big investment decisions that were important for, the, for many of the countries where I was working were being made uh, with very little data, sometimes none at all. And that's because it can be very challenging for many places to have the uh, established governance, the financial resources, the human resources, the, the organizations and the ministries to actually manage the huge volume of data that we collect traditionally on the ground, measuring things like rainfall, temperature, uh, all the things related to water, like water quality, how much water runs in our rivers, groundwater monitoring. And what's really cool about satellites is that from the vantage point of space, you know, there are no political boundaries, right? So we can, the same data that we're collecting in Southern California, relevant to agriculture or relevant to uh, droughts, can also be used in other parts of the world. Now, there's some caveats to that that we'll talk about, uh, but that makes it really equitable. And from an environmental justice perspective, it makes it really cool, right? Very useful. And it helps us, some of the things that came up in the, um, in the sessions this morning, things around actually d data sharing and, and that being a challenge uh, when it comes to especially countries that, that may, you know, could really benefit from potential cooperation, but data sharing is a challenge. And if used in the right way and with not just from a technical perspective, but used in uh, congruence with, you know, bringing the science and the engineering together with the governance, you can really use satellite data for amazing things, right? It brings that oversight and that transparency that we often need in water resources management, in watershed management that you talked about, the basin level management, not, not adhering to political boundaries. And so I'll wrap this up quickly now. Um, so I, I, I realized this, and so I, I started to pursue, you know, data and, and I started to learn about space and satellites and had a really fun time working with NASA Goddard, had a really fun time working on the application side with, uh, within the US government on decision making. And then along the way, and, and now I get to bring all of that here, and along the way I met some really amazing people. And what's interesting about the space sector is that it's very, it's very exciting, especially when it comes to Earth observations, which is basically Everything, all the satellites that we, we talked about that are looking down, not looking up. They're looking down at Earth. Um, and so the panel today is uh, really representing kind of the cross the entire value chain or across that entire um, uh, spectrum of this sector, which is satellite data for applications like water management. Um, and so we have Ms. Atiyah Javad from Planet Labs, that is a commercial company. I'll let you talk a little bit more about, uh, about your work and about Planet. Uh, Jonathan Henley, yes, did I get that? I hope so. Sorry? Hendry, Hendry thank you. Uh, we, just, we just met more recently. Uh, from For Earth Intelligence, which is really a, an analytics company that looks at using all the satellite data for decision making. And then we have Esam Hagi from uh, Kiri, but also many other places. Uh, so you, uh, it's very interesting, I want you to tell this story, but you started out as a Martian scientist that then saw the, the applications to Earth science. So 
Um, so Dr. Assam manages uh, is a director of the Earth Science um, program at CURI, um, in, along with a number of other things that you do, activities related to NASA. So I'm going to start with this first. Simple prompts. Um, if each of you can kind of introduce, you know, you can introduce yourselves, where you come from. I think it's all very interesting. Your organization, and then how? Just give one example of how satellite data is being used to uh, to support water. Kind of like some of the themes that we've been talking about related to water management, water governance. Okay. Thank you, guys. My name is Atif Jawad. I'm an aerospace engineer by background. So I really learned how to build those satellites. And right now, for the last seven years, I've been working on Earth observation data. So it's, um, it's a company I work for Planet. Uh, we revolutionized the, the space around building large satellites, and we miniaturized them. Uh, so by doing so, we have about 250 satellite, operational satellites in orbit. And we take information off the Earth every single day of every single place. Um, and so we changed that data game into terabytes of data. And right now, you're able to build large-scale trends around the environment, understand your global trends around your coral reefs, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there's myriads of applications that can be brought about by just having this type of data set. Of course, it's like one side of the data set. You have a thousand other types of data sets that you need to build real solutions. Um, and maybe, and the last part of the question <laughs> was, if I could give an example, um, I think like one of the biggest examples in the region is to understand um, desertification, the, the way actually, afforestation more than desertification, uh, and where the water content is stored in the soil so that you can build up um, large-scale applications around countrywide applications, yeah. I'll go next. Um, so Jonathan Hendry, my background is physics, specializing mostly in geophysics. Marine geophysics was my focus. And then very quickly dived into the world of satellite imagery. So rather than drilling for oil and punching waves through the ground. Instead, we just look through the atmosphere and we try and derive through water columns or through the atmosphere, but it is exactly the same science. So we took what's going on in the oil and gas industry and we can apply it straight to, to satellite data. And that's a really powerful element. Um, I'll dive straight into what we do. Um, <laughs> one of the focuses, I think the one that's really coming to mind is and we keep talking about artificial intelligence in so many different ways. I feel like it has to be mentioned. So we started by just looking at imagery, just processing using algorithms, just correcting for water columns. But actually, you need in situ data for a lot of that. And actually, we can do that in a lot of the world. But using AI, there's a lot of learning that can go on within that. So then we can actually anticipate what we're going to see in areas that don't have so much in situ data, don't have field work. But we can train on a small portion of that and then apply it to a region. So for example, the key one really is you want a really solid academic example. Ideally, you want many of those. And then we can use that as the training data that then feeds satellite imagery. So we would then use all of these different wavelengths, all of the kind of data numbers that we find in that, and we'll apply it through those algorithms. But we have the training data from robust academic literature, from robust field work. And that can be peer reviewed really fully. And then we can take that data. And ideally, we just keep building on that. So that's really what we focus on. And in the marine context, I think the thing I'm most excited about, this, there's so many examples we could give, but is tip and cue. So it's taking open source data of an entire region. So our focus at the moment is the Gulf. And it's looking at water quality or looking at salinity and actually saying, this isn't a complex problem using satellite data, but it's a robust, repeatable, transparent, independent process that anyone can repeat. And that's why I think Natasha touched on it this morning. You want data that is trusted. You want data that is repeatable, that somebody else could go and use and come to the same conclusions. You want somebody completely outside of your domain, your country, your jurisdiction, your everything, and you want to use that data. And then once we've done that with open source data, we go to people like Planet, and then we say, please, can we have higher, higher resolution? And we'll zoom into the problem. And it's only when we see a problem in that coarser resolution, that open source data, 
every 16 days can be repeated. We'll then zoom into the problem and use an image that is kind of more recently collected. And um, then we can do real analysis on that image. Most of the time, there's a bespoke problem in there. Um, so my, my favorite example that we're working on now is we can look at uh, water quality problems and see their financial benefit or their financial gain loss. So a really easy example is mangroves. If you destroy mangroves, your coastline is going to be vulnerable to storm surges. You destroy mangroves, you get rid of that carbon sequestered. You can understand that. You can also understand what happens in the soil. All of those things are possible from satellites and I still sit at my desk. <laughs> I don't have to do anything um, apart from just apply these algorithms in an intelligent, robust, scientific way. I'll stop there, but that's why I find it really exciting. Yeah. So good morning, everyone. My name is Esam Hegi, and uh, I have one of the busiest jobs on the planet. It's very simple. I work in Kahiri looking for disaster in the environmental and natural disaster in the Middle East. So you can think if you watch TV. You can see that every week we have a disaster. We have the earthquake in Libya. We have the flash flood in Libya. We have the fires in Algeria. We have an explosion in Lebanon, uh, in, in the port of Lebanon, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So when we started this program in 2018 uh, in Qatar Foundation in Hamad bin Khalifa University, the idea was why would the, why do we need space? I mean, you think of it. Our our area in the Middle East. We thrive by skepticism, and skepticism is often confused with realism. I mean, I'm realistic. I mean, I have this water. Why do I need to go to space to look over it? I have this uh, this spot. I see it with my eyes. Why do I need to go for, for space to see it? And one thing I learned in my 25 years in working in science and engineering in, in many agencies, in the NASA, in the French Space Agency, in California Institute of Technology, and uh, in other places, that in science doesn't advance with common sense. Common sense is good at home. At workplace, you need science, observation, modeling, engineering, risk assessment, not your common sense. And because we thrive by the common sense, I will show you some real world example of how, why we need Earth observation. And the first example I will start with is a very recent example that happened a month ago. It's in Libya. So you all know that a month ago, 11,000 people, they died with a flood in the desert. Right? So first of all, you can think of this information. You live in the Sahara and you have a flood that will kill 11,000 people and will destroy half of the city of Terna. In a common sense, if I'm in the Sahara, I will die from lack of water, not from excess of water. So once again here, common sense doesn't work. Now, why this happened in Terna? And you watch it on TV. Many people would say, if we give an alert, we could have saved life, right? The answer is wrong. If we give an alert in Libya, we would not save anybody. Probably we could have caused more people will die. And let me give you the answer why. The answer is why, because you don't have a risk assessment program at all. So if you inform the community that you're gonna flood in a day, people will run in all directions causing accidents and, and it's a chaos, and they don't know where to escape. Probably you're gonna agglomerate more people in a higher risk zone. And so when, it, when, the, when the, the, the storm Daniel was ready to hit Libya within a day, it was already too late. And why it was too late? <coughs> because of the common sense, let me take you now, the sequence of events that led this to be a deadly one. Derna is a small city. It's about eight kilometer by four kilometer. It has water management facilities, all type of utilities and, and civil engineering facilities we all know. But what we don't know, that the city of Derna is an outlet of a big watershed that is 160 kilometer by 50 kilometer. That watershed collected water and flooded in the uh, in uh, in uh, early September, in 11th of September, when the storm has hit, that watershed has not been observed 
by any data. The drought, the changes that happened in that watershed are not understood by anybody, least observed or in the center of interest of anyone. It's a huge area that is not, that is not observed. And that's where the problem has happened. When it rained, it collected all this water and went to hit the first dam, the second dam, they broke it and it reached the city and it terminated the life of 11,000 people. Now, when you hear the story, you might think that we are lucky because in this room, we are away from these things. How if I tell you that this has happened exactly in the spot where you are here today? In 1923, which is known in Qatari history as the year of mud, Amr Taba, a similar storm has hit uh, the Gulf area, Qatar, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait, and took the life of 8,000 people and destroyed 80% of the ships that were in the sea. And it caused one year of famine in that year. This happened 100, 100 years ago. So there is no place in our society where we are immune from these risks. And the only way for us to avoid these risks is to study them on a global scale and have enough of the data to look at them. The examples multiply and multiply from, from, from Derna to Morocco, to Tunisia, to Egypt. And in all of these, what always, the sequence of event was, we have no data, we have no observations. And most of all, we thought that these things would never happen. So this is my job in Kahiri. And uh, I was born in Libya, so, uh, so it's, it, it touched my heart to, 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 to see that. I'm not from Libya, I'm from Egypt. My family's from Egypt. I am a geophysicist and uh, I do space instrumentation. And I've been doing both for 25 years because I can't understand them yet in full way. Thank you so much to, to all three of you. I think what's really great is that when I feel like when all of us start to talk about this topic, even though it seems very disconnected, it's so it's, it's so techy, right? It feels a bit disconnected. Literally, it's in space. It's the operations are in space. But I think when we start to really talk about the applications, it's a very human centered conversation. You, you know, you, 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 um, you, the data are only useful when, well, basic research aside, but more and more we're seeing that these data are very useful for, for things that are very important to societal value. So I have a couple of um, questions based on everything that was said. Jonathan, I am um, reflecting on what Asam just said about this, the data not being available, right? So it seems like if we want to have an early warning system for, for places like Libya, elsewhere in the world, uh, you have to have some historical information, so you base the, uh, okay, you have to know what the norm is, and then you have to then from that predict the, uh, the, the departure from norm. So can you talk about the process at your company, how you, you know, when you have a new um, customer or clients, um, how do you work with them in building that historical record? And, you know, what, what are the challenges with that? Gladly. Um one of my favorite things is when I started, we had about three satellites we played with, and now we play with about 700, and that's only in the last eight years. So <laughs> I think that's really powerful, but what's incredible, so that's been the density in the last kind of you know, decade. But going back in time, we can actually go back to you know, 1972, and we can look at a completely new, let's say new, but for example, this Libyan location, we can look back to 1972 and do analysis on NASA, Landsat, one <laughs> data, and we can push that through every year. You know, we can get multiple iterations, like kind of every month. We can understand this huge wealth of data. When we talk about processing terabytes, something we did recently, which was quite interesting, was we thought, you know what, let, let's really go for it. So we processed 200 terabytes of data in under a month, and we got this huge archive of data. But what's amazing is we're just using the latest tech. Like, I tell you now, it's nothing that fancy. We bought a 20,000 pound computer. That is not that much when we talk about supercomputers. And we were able to process 20, uh, 200 terabytes of data in under a month. And from that, we were able to understand flood risk. We could understand wildfires. We could understand uh, arid conditions. We could also report on the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals, many of which are enshrined as good practice and the standard methodology for defining these SDG goals. 
these Millennium Development Goals. They're literally standard practice. They're not new. And a lot of this is like quite simple science. But we can see this huge archive of data now that we can really get hold of. We can really process quickly in the cloud on our own computers. And there's this huge kind of power that's associated. So there's a lot of open source work that we can do. And really, it's about bringing in the right people to set it up. And then actually, people can just run with it. We can make things, a lot of these things push button. As I said, we work in that tip and cue method. You have the tip that works with that open source data that is push button. And then you queue together the kind of more deeper analysis. And so coming back to your point, we'll work with a specific government or a specific country to focus on their key problem not focus on what we think their problem is. And I think Kieran put it really well this morning. It's not bringing an engineering solution and trying to find the problem. <laughs> it's about saying, what's your problem? And we've done the thing where we, we go off on a tangent and we try and develop this solution, but actually it just never hits the problem because the problem always changes. So that's kind of where we're at. That's how we work. And that, I mean, 50 years of data you can have at any location on the earth. So powerful and so dense as well. And yes, I want to add to that. Uh, you said something very, very important that most of people want to see the solution, mm -hmm. but without understanding the problem. Mm -hmm. And by rushing solutions, we are many times ex exporting solutions from, from an environment that is not uh, relevant to ours, and then it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And we see that in uh, artificial uh, injection of the groundwater in, in many things. Uh, so that is really very important by important to take the time that the companies take the, the time to help the customers understand their problem. Mm -hmm. This is require one or two years of study at least and then implementing the solution. Most of the people want just jump to the solution. Yeah. I have a specific question for you, but actually if you want to weigh in on that. Um, I, I, I think a lot of times um, the governments know the problem. Well, they come to you and say, I have this problem. Then there is the solution that you want to build up, but they don't have that two years time to wait. So it's often, you know, you have to jump step to a solution and then that's not. Um, well, yeah. Sending the physics of the problem. Yeah, exactly. Okay. What, what is the driver of, for instance, the flooding or things? We might think it's rain. Sometimes we think it's also related to the soil moisture. So it can be a convoluted, physics that we need to understand. And I think in, to, that, to that point, actually, this is a really, um, this is a space, uh, no pun intended with that, um, but this is an area of work where actually basic research is incredibly important and getting that right is incredibly, getting the physics right is incredibly important uh, as well as is AI, as is uh, learning to work with large data sets, as is making things visually, um, friendly for people and making it easy to digest. Uh, so I want to just take us back for a moment because there's some concepts that I think might be useful to discuss too. You talked about the 50 years of satellite data from the Landsat mission, right? So that's, uh, that's a government satellite. And um, historically, the, the governments, so meaning the NASA is a government agency uh, out of the United States. Um, the European Space Agency is a conglomerate of European uh, countries that have come together to form ESA. There's JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency, and there's UAE Space Agency, so on and so on. Some are more established than others, and they're focusing on different things. But what's interesting here is that we have um, Atia from Planet, which is a commercial company. So I wonder if you, talk, if you could talk a little bit about that uh, what is the value? Why do companies, so meaning a commercial company, they're, they're building and launching their own satellites. Not, not, it's not a government operated satellite. So if you could talk a little bit about that, what it, why did this come about? And how does the commercial sector work with the public sector? I mean, the, uh, the, the public sector actually set standards. So they, they are the first people who really went about doing a lot of study to build these large satellites. I think that the commercial sector, and, and we're just, we started maybe a revolution, but there is going to be a hundred more companies building these CubeSats. And our satellites are um, like 30 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter, and there are a lot of them in space. 
Um, and they, they take images at a much higher resolution than, let's say, the public sector. And so we found this gap in between where, you know, it was not just the resolution in terms of the, the spatial resolution, but also having data that's much, much more frequent allows you to build much better trends around um, climate, for example. It's all about predictive trend building and analysis and early warning systems. And also, for example, I'll take the example of Pakistan when they had their floods, right? 33 million people were affected. There was a lot of food security in that, in that time. Agricultural lands were lost. But if you don't have this data set that goes back and sees exactly when that started was melt of a glacier. Nobody talks about that, actually. And it's a, a glacier full country. It has more than 3,000 glaciers that can melt and create a period of like rainfall, drought, and then those floods come about. So, uh, and it affects a lot of people. So what, what our company is doing really as a commercial sector is it's not trying to, I mean, it's building new technology, but putting also that technology in right people's hands. Um, actually, I feel like we're at this cusp of this new risk era where countries want to grow, but at the same time want to be secure or have water and food security at the same time. And so how do you bring these two together is by putting more technology in the right people's hands. And so, and I have a question. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. So, so just as a follow up for um, anyone that maybe is less familiar, yeah. can you explain uh, spatial resolution and what you mean by higher mm -hmm. versus coarser spatial resolution? So basically, think of it as your satellite taking a picture on Earth, and when you have. Um, uh, the, the Landsat satellites from 50 years ago, they were taking it at 30 meter resolution. So one pixel would be 30 meters. Right now, we're at like the ones that we have on a regular basis are at three to four meters. So every pixel is three to four meters. So you can see a tree crown or you can see like one whole tree in one pixel maybe. Um, or you have much higher resolution, which goes up to 50 centimeters, 30 centimeters right now, satellites that take much, much more detail of our location. So you have much better resolution. It's like watching HDTV via satellite, basically, uh, of images of Earth uh, every single day. Yeah. So we have all these satellites, public, commercial, more and more are coming. When it comes to some of the water challenges that have been, that we've been talking about, uh, whether it's too much water, too little water, too polluted, too political, is our, uh, is our challenge now to, are we, do we have a data scarcity challenge? Or is it a data analysis challenge? Or is it something else that I'm not even naming? And, and really, yeah, if you want to go ahead. Me too. Um, I think it was Hamad this morning said something really pertinent. Um, even though it's said so frequently, it, there's, there's a real depth to it. It's the data-driven decision-making is a very easy thing to say. <laughs> it's got to be the right data for the decision, though. And um, you talked about visualization. Um, we thought giving maps was a really good idea to people, make them really high resolution, let them zoom in. Actually, that's not very helpful. Isolating what's their threshold for what do they actually care about? When is salinity too high for a desalination plant? When are you going to get brine that's actually not usable? When are you not going to be able to use that wastewater and recycle it? That's the important bit. So it's actually some, some, when we work with finance firms, they literally say to us, I don't want a map, I don't want geospatial, I want a number. I just want the number. I want, to give, I want you to give me comma separated values. I don't want the map because all they want is the data to make the decision. And that's the kind of key piece. We have so much data. We have hundreds of petabytes of data. What we don't have is the specific analysis for specific problems. And they are a huge amount of the time bespoke. And actually the ones that aren't bespoke, 
NASA, ESA do a fantastic job of producing those nice layers. I'm going to say it again, but tip and cue. <laughs> we use the tip of all of that data, that open source data that is fantastic, that's iterated upon, that is standard robust. And we zoom in and we solve a specific problem. And it's, it's always specific. So we've talked this morning about, you know, water, water security in Qatar. Is it actually that big an issue? In the wider Gulf, yeah, more so. In Africa, much more so. And so it's that kind of, it, it's that depth. It's solving a specific problem, I think. It's the right data. Um, and I won't get, I'll stop there, but we can please grab me afterwards if you have specific problems, because there are so many applications for this. Just so many. And I wanted to ask you, Dr. Assam, about the, uh, some of the work that you've done is looking at the changing coastlines in Qatar, in the region, in the Gulf. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, I know you, you've, you publish a lot in, in uh, academic journals as well, your findings. Mm -hmm. What are the key trends that you're finding by using the satellite data in terms of the changing dynamics in the Gulf? Okay, and it's, it's a very important question for the Gulf area, uh, especially when we talk about uh, coastal change. At first glance, my appear at something that we don't care about, I mean, what the cost uh, change or doesn't change, doesn't impact a lot other than the visual to the sea. But if you look to how these coastal change are happening, we have 2,000 uh, 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 island in the Gulf, 2,000. These islands are 99% of them inhabited. Nobody living on these islands. But they are all at the sea level. With the sea level rise, these islands are disappearing and changing location. So some of their islands disappear, some of them appear. So these are a lot of this population of these islands, 20% of these islands on maps, they are slightly moving or slightly disappearing and, and reappearing as function of the change of the sea level rise. Now, <coughs> if you look, what does this make? This changed the maritime borders. And this is why if you look to the Gulf area, every conflict in the Gulf area, in the heart of that conflict, there is always an island. Abu Musa Island, Hawar Island, uh, and uh, between Kuwait and Iraq, there is an island in the east of Paros Island. So we always have island issues and simply not because of the map are inaccurate, simply because a lot of these, of these small islands, the sandy islands, are moving, eroding, appearing, and disappearing. So an important uh, uh, aspect is that we understand that our environment, it's a desert. So it gives the illusion that nothing happened in it, uh, versus if you look to the Amazons or the forest or the, or the ice, uh, uh, ice cap, but in fact, this is not true. The desert is changing very fast in a very unpredictable way, changing the sedimentation, the groundwater, the soil moisture, the dust storm, and all of that impact human life and resources in, uh, 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 in these areas. We had uh, a lot of images which, which showed the disappearance of islands. The island that existed in 1958 who today disappeared, they submerged. So I think the Earth observations allow us to look to these phenomena, which we cannot look from the visual eye because this change is, is a, such a small one happening from year to, to, to year that you really require a, a database to look at that. And you, absolutely. And one of the things that you touched on is groundwater. And of course, that's one of the big challenges that the region is facing, many parts of the world uh, are facing. So how can satellite data be used to look at groundwater? I know we have some capabilities, but it's somewhat limited what we can do. So I want to kind of understand from you what you see at the, as the present capabilities and where is the future uh, going to take us, groundwater specifically. So we have a video. Maybe I can show that. To, okay. to, to put some spice in the audience, <laughs> okay. That shows our future mission. It's 
Is the sound working? And it's a mission designed to look for two things, sea level rise and the change in the groundwater. We see deserts expanding and the ice sheets are shrinking. There is no denying that our planet is undergoing rapid change. Since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, humans have been emitting larger and larger amounts of climate warming gases. This in turn is causing the planet to warm. The results are ice sheets melting and sea levels rising, which causes shorelines to retreat, threaten our cities, and infringe on valuable reservoirs of water that lie below the desert surface. Increased pumping of groundwater actually accelerates sea level rise. Low-lying areas such as Florida and the Arabian Peninsula are particularly vulnerable, and so we must know more. Once launched, OASIS will study the Earth's shrinking ice and aquifers. The constellation of satellites will bounce radio waves off the Earth's surface. OASIS will use these measurements to observe melting over Greenland and the aquifers under the deserts and Antarctic ice thickness. OASIS, helping humanity prepare for a rapidly changing planet. Okay, so that's that's uh, one of our mission, and I just want to show you about these islands, just in case uh, uh, for fun for people in the audience. That's that would like to see that. No. Uh, Uh, Esam, what is the, what's the projected outlook? When will this mission be launched? So uh, this mission is supposed to launch in 2027 okay. and uh, here. Uh, uh, I'm just trying. Are okay, we getting an here. early look at a, at a publication? <laughs> so... <laughs> So, cool. just to tell, so this paper is in Nature Communication, so it's it's okay. It's now accepted in review, and one of the nice example I want to show you is is you see this island, uh, Ras Abu Ghmis in the east of Qatar. Uh, I'm sorry, you see the first one here. In 1958, it is here on the airborne image. In 2020, totally disappeared, totally disappeared. And then you have many examples in the paper which we show about 113 islands who disappeared. So, so uh, yeah, many thanks. So this is just one example how serious these things are and how least unspoken they are about. I mean, and you can think of it again, your first enemy in science is common sense. Nobody lives on these islands. Why should we care about it? Why should we spend a mission with hundreds of millions of dollars to study a place nobody lives in? Because they define your maritime border. And if you lose your maritime border, you lose access to oil and gas field because most of it is offshore. Now it's a billion dollar question and now it's a, it's a security issue. So anything uh, in the Middle East, any environmental uncertainty, and climatic uncertainty and resource uncertainty, it turned very quickly to a security issue 
not because of the magnitude of the risk, but it's because of the magnitude of the uncertainty associated to, to that risk. So for instance, uh, in the Eastern Nile Basin, there is a big dispute between Egypt, Sudan, and Ethiopia regarding the damming and water and activity. That dispute, the, the, in the essence of it, it's not the effect that there are the, the dams and the, and, the, and, the, and the lack of water. The essence of the dispute is the uncertainty associated to the forecast of water. How much water will be there? So it's not how much water we just need. So until we tackle these uncertainties, with satellite observations, we will be in, in a tense situation to understand our future. Even if we, go ahead. If, even if we baseline today, we have an uh, idea of, of the future. So it's more or less, it should be happening even today. We need to baseline all our surface water, groundwater, and everything to go back to this uh, so that in 50 years we don't lose more islands important point in there, and it was the point that, that was made this morning about trust, trust in the data. Uh, in many parts of the world, not, not just unique to here, but there's, there's a lack of, there's a mistrust in, in satellite data in particular, actually. And I will say, reflecting on uh, some of the work that I did in, in the US, there's a mistrust of satellite data in particular of uh, tribes in, in the US native populations because the uh, at times, the data were used to make certain decisions that impacted the tribes negatively, and they had no control over that because it's unbiased data that you know government satellites and and it's tracking. So um, I kind of wanted to yeah I mean we can we can talk about it here, but also I'm I'm curious to get um, the audience to weigh in on this. What are the perceptions uh, if you have a perspective, especially from the region, about satellite data? Do you think that that trust is there? Is that something that, you know, can you trust if somebody tells you this is unbiased data because it came from satellites? Trust us? Are, are governments going to trust? Are people, uh, citizens, or, you know, I, and, and uh, you're, you're saying maybe no? Maybe. So I think that um, it has to be more like um, acknowledged by the community, the society, in order for them to trust this kind of data, especially that's coming from the governments. And usually, like uh, where I come from, Palestine, uh, the trust issue, it's a, it's a really big issue to trust such data. So uh, that's my opinion on, on it. Perspectives from any others, yep. and I think maybe the mic was not on actually. Yeah. Hello. Good. Uh, yes, there are some very, real insights there. Um, and in my field, uh, we use satellite data quite a lot, which is archaeology. And on the matter of trust, um, we often come up against this because we understand a certain uh, area to be inhabited at a certain um, uh, period of time or we believe that uh, you know a town may have expanded in a, into a certain direction at a certain uh, in a certain period of time but uh, uh, memory uh, it does not always tally exactly with what we see so very often people have different opinions about um, uh, who was in a certain place or what was happening in a certain place in a given decade or in a given year uh, and in fact, it's just because the human memory over a period of 20, 30, 40 years um, often uh, juxtaposes things. You know, they'll, they'll say, no, that if we're trying to reconstruct a building, for example, they say, no, it wasn't like that because, you know, it, it had these extra rooms or something. And then you find out when you, when you improve your data set that they're absolutely right as well, but those particular rooms are no longer extant or, or they were added and taken away or something like that. And it's the same with um, inhabited areas. You get you get villages and campsites which pop up and then disappear. A lot depends on what time of year you're looking at the data and even what time of day. So many of these disappearing islands, for example, when we look at the satellite imagery, they come and go depending on whether it's high tide or not. Um, so they will disappear for sure when we look at one or two meters 
sea rise. But very often you have to look at the time of day or, or, and the time of year to work out what exactly is going on. You have to be quite precise with your data and get as much of it as you can. Incidentally, some of these islands have got a lot of archaeology on them, which are going to disappear in the long term. Marawa, for example, I just want to add, archaeology. I just want to add one thing to that. Mm -hmm. The images you saw are corrected for the exact time yeah, of the day and in the season. Of course, I mean, we not, I mean, we understand that there is the, that, that tight yeah, levels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And once again, I think I hear common sense is coming here versus satellite observations, but yeah, it's yeah, okay. Sure. But you also have <laughs> processes of geomorphology which deposit sand and take them away as well. So yeah. there's certain parts of the coastline, which are, we've used this, of course, which are very different uh, in the past compared to how they now, because the sand has moved. Um, and th th this happens too. So really, the more data you have, the better you get. But you will always come across um, uh, contrary opinions, if you like, because people don't necessarily remember it the same way that you do, or because your data set is not complete. Uh, and it could be both or either. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's a really nice example, and I'm going to stick with the whole satellite example. We ran a project over Kiribati, which is 5.5 million square kilometers of the South Pacific. And these are the first climate change refugees that the world has had. Um, these people saw 30 centimeters on average of sea level rise. And the really important piece is tides come and go and <laughs> the, the sea level rise is not the same. And it does vary. But again, if you look back at a 50 year period, you can iron out seasonality, you can iron out them. So it's super important to say, you can't just look at one or two images. And what's really hard and what I don't like saying, but need to is you actually need to be able to like code, you need algorithms, you need proper tech, you need real software to work through this data to get to that point, which is why it's so important to use that wealth of data, because quite often we see people do one or two manual, they'll open up the GIS, they'll do that, but they'll only choose two or three data points. And that's not robust. And also because of the fact that now you have public satellites and you have like private satellite companies such as ours, you're able to verify sometimes, you know, what government, some government is saying versus the other. And there's more multiple data sources as well that can add up to this. So the more data, the better. Um, so it's, it's exactly, I just want to add one thing, that every data has an ambiguity. And what we qualify as a detection is expert users clearly, like in the case of sea level rise or disappearing islands or archaeological detection, the, the ambiguity of the data does not drive its utility. I mean, unfortunately, an expert user will take the ambiguity as an argument that this we should not say, which should not appear. Like we say, there is a location which will, will appear between day and night. Well, but it will not, we should look to hyperspectral, we should look to radar data. Mm -hmm. So whenever we have ambiguity in one, one part of the spectrum, we usually look to the other part of the spectrum. So by looking to the uncertainty in the data we have uh, today from Earth, from Earth observation, for questions like for river hydrology, for instance, I think the ambiguity in space data, even whatever it is small or large, but it is quantifiable. When many ambiguities we have from the, the, the ground data, especially in the, in the in developing nations, like in Africa, is not even quantifiable. And so there's not one or the other, both should exist in one world. Yeah. So just to translate that, um, when, when you talked about uh, consulting different types of sensors, really what that translates to, um, or an analogy for that is when you do an, an interview, you want to find out the, the answer to a question, you interview multiple people with different perspectives. In, in some ways that can complement, and then you find the merged, uh, you know, you find the answer somewhere in there. So not every, not every challenge is going to maybe require multiple satellites. Yes. So much, it's, uh, I'm answering the question whether in Kuwait we trust uh, the data or we don't, we definitely do. Because uh, we trust the data from NASA more than the data we get from the government. Because every, I worked as a consultant for the Minister of Electricity and Water. And every minister that arrives wants to polish the data, the time he was at the ministry, just to show that the aquifers hasn't depleted and everything is okay. And there is no seawater intrusion. So 
we do trust the data that comes compared to the data we get from the ministry for that reason. We knew from NASA that our aquifers had depleted by 92%. This will not be given to us from the, the government. So. Really interesting. Yeah. And yeah, in the back. Um, thank you for sharing. Um, I just had a question. So as an educator who works a lot with students who are new to science, what type of skills would you want those students to be able to develop for these big data systems thinking type problems? I've answered this question so many times <laughs> and I'm so glad because it's so, so important in every nation. Um, I'm afraid it is as simple as people need to learn to code. <laughs> um, there are, in a satellite image, there are just layers of data. Those layers are a matrix. We need people to be able to understand kind of maths, and we need them to be able to code. These, comp these, these things are, they're, they're really friendly in certain coding languages, but like MATLAB, really friendly. But it's really important, bluntly that people can do a basic level of coding. And you, you can learn that pretty easily. There's loads of really good tutorials, but that is a really fundamental skill. And, and the other one is quite honestly critical thinking and just saying what I'm looking at doesn't make sense. And if it's a common sense issue, you dig and you dig and you dig and you're like, it's still not making sense. Well, maybe I should go and talk to someone, find out if there's another part that I'm not understanding. Um, so yeah, critical thinking is a really, really fundamental one. Um, and I'm afraid the, the, the technical run is always coding, I'm afraid. We need big data. I think like... It's just RGB, it's just what your eyes are seeing, but what the satellites are taking are bands of frequencies. So they have so many different bands, and making calculations out of the bands, you can know crop yield, you can, know, you can classify what crops are on the ground, you can see how much water there is, how much water is needed. Uh, your entire agricultural process can be really um, managed. Well, what all natural resources ultimately can be managed by just um, uh, making a few calculations around these bands of data. So also carbon in the atmosphere. And that's, that's why you need to learn to code. And I want to add three additional skills. To complement yeah. the coding, coding is very important. Uh, GIS yeah. is very important for, for a whole slew of applications. Uh, that's basically an interface that takes all the, you know, like kind of the background code and makes it a little bit more tangible for us to apply to, to, uh, to different things. Uh, the other is science. Uh, understand because the, the data alone and just the coding alone, you have to understand some of the physics and some of the, um, the drivers as much as we want to rely on AI. And we can. The AI can give us some pretty cool predictions and do a good job. But at the end of the day, physics is going to govern things within a watershed. And you have to understand when you said critical reasoning, but I think that comes from physics-based yes. critical reasoning of knowing when an answer is totally wrong, when you know the salinity is totally off the charts and it doesn't make any sense. Uh, if you just get a response from your code, uh, you know, uh, you, and and the third is. Uh, social science yeah. and and uh, and kind of the humanities actually because the other especially if you're on the part of trying to use the data on really any part of it I would argue even technology development of the most complicated things that that NASA and other space agencies build it comes down to humans and how humans work together and the understanding of of, um, uh, of so, so social science um, so I think without that, it's, um, it's hard to translate the, the technical into the useful. And I think, like, actually, all three of you, this is a lot of what you work on, is actually translating the technical into the useful. Um, and, and, and yeah. it's often going, that, that actual stuff, because I think I said that, I call it high EQ, but just high emotional empathy. Ah, uh, that's okay. really neat. And so actually, you, you, you don't start with the data. Again, you start with what's actually the problem I need to solve. So it is also that high EQ to be able to get into, critically think, what does a person need? What are they invested in themselves? Why are they invested in that? Let me unpiece that. Right, now we can talk about what the problem is before we think about what the solution is. So I was sticking with the big data. <laughs> I would also add part of it, 
politics and policy ultimately. I think the final step is to build policies out of what you, the trends you find or, you know, to understand uh, what environmental policies need to be implemented. So the question of the, of the educator, this is really a very good question. And Rahi, you said that it's the physics of the phenomena we look at. But most importantly, you can see how the introduction to a student to space is different from in our area than other places in the world that applied the concepts of understanding the physics. For instance, <coughs> in, uh, in China and uh, uh, India, the, the, the two mission, uh, Chang'e and uh, Chandrayaan, uh, both of them going to, to, to the moon, they revamped the way people in China and India, they think about space. And they boosted the, 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 the people who joined engineering and, uh, and, the, uh, and, the, and science. While in our area, space research is mostly perceived as being an astronaut. And the fascination of being an astronaut makes that an astronaut is a one man and it's being a hero. While being a member of the Chang E mission or, or Chandrayaan 1, 2, and 3, which I, I, I worked with them, it's being a part of a big group of people who are trying to achieve something amazing. And that's what the difference between our perception of being a hero, probably wearing these things with patches. And uh, I mean, and by the way, don't get me wrong, I worked for eight years in the astronaut training program. So, uh, yeah, and I have um, patches, I have pictures, I can show the astronaut uh, the training in Johnson Space Center. But that <coughs> did not make us want to learn the, the physics and the math of our planet and the solar system versus India and China, which did an excellent job in this. It's very interesting. I mean, I think that the field right now is, uh, is, is very exciting. And very global as well. So I want to open it up. We have about 25 minutes left to questions. Yes. Thanks for all this. I'm wondering, um, you know, given the explosion of satellites, big data analysis, sensor technology, what is the frontier? What is it that you really, really want that you don't have right now? What's the toy? What's the analysis that would really open up a new sort of avenue for for uh, information or, or uh, our ability to respond to environmental challenges that we can't right now? I may answer this question as we are in this frustrating uh, situation where we need to increase. So the detector we have right now, most of the satellites, they use optical or, uh, or basically they look at the surface of the Earth. And we need more satellites that are able to probe the first 50 meter of the subsurface, one kilometer in the ice. So we need to image the subsurface. So basically, we need to, ha we need to have lower frequencies VHF satellite radar that can look to the thickness of the ice in the, in the, in the caps of the Earth to quantify the volume of that ice and, uh, and put that in the model to understand sea level rise. We need these VHF satellites that you saw in, uh, in the video that allow us to explore and map subsurface aquifers in the Sahara in the first 50 meter. So basically, I think the, the big development in the future, we need to be to these techniques, radar and microwave, which allow us to, to see beyond the surface, the surface and beyond the surface. As a pyramid, I think what you spoke about was the foundational sensors that you need. You have these different sensors of um, da data that's being collected. That's the first layer. The second layer is how do you make sense of that? What are the insights you're getting out of it? That's pretty much what Jonathan is doing, right? Jonathan's company, they build taking out parts of the information and making sense of it. The next few layers are really looking at, you know, what the governments or let's say, how do you use it? How do you implement it? There's gaps in every one of this portion of this pyramid. Ultimately, it's the indicators. You have like world level global indicators of where you'll be going. Like how do you calculate losses and damages and how do you put financial value to this loss and damage? There's 30 vulnerable countries in the world. 
how does uh, how do you then make a few countries accountable for the climate change that they are causing, whereas what's happening in parts of the world where you know they're not causing this climate change? Where do you build all this money out? I think that that's like the high level. So in every portion of that pyramid, there is a lot of gaps and everybody's trying to crack this in the Earth observation world. But when you're in the space world, an astronaut or like the outer space is much, much more appreciated than like what's looking back to Earth. So we're not, we're not focusing on, we're the few people who think about how to use space to help Earth. And that's a small portion of the space world. I'm going to, I think you've given great answers. So I'm not going to add to, I want more tech, even though I am a huge techno optimist. I think so much effort, so much time goes into designing better satellites, better systems. And actually, the world does quite a good job of it. I was with the UK Space Agency. They're working in collaboration with the UAE Space Agency and in the same room as JAXA, Japanese Space Agency. And uh, NASA were there too. And it was incredible. It was absolutely amazing. You hear of the funding opportunity, you hear of the satellites, great. If I'm perfectly honest, what we actually need is standards. I've already said, like, we create the bespoke solution. But if I'm perfectly honest, what we actually need is to do me out of that job. I shouldn't have to create a bespoke solution. There should be standards. There should be governance that is accepted by as much of the world as possible. TNFD is the Task Force for Nature-Based Financial Disclosure. It was released in September, and it's really going live. COP28, it's a huge issue. And it's basically saying, here's how loss and damages can work. Here's how carbon credits can work. Here's how biodiversity credits could work. Here is the facility agreed by the United Nations, agreed by so many nations. And that's actually, if I'm honest, what I would much rather see people's time, money, and technology spent building. Not even more different technologies. I actually think that's really where I'd love to see a lot of time spent, as much as I love the tech side, and I want to see more of it, we're doing a good job of that. The agreement, the multifaceted, the multidiscipline, that's the, that's the heart of it. I think that's a really good point, and also where you can build that trust and credibility uh, to, to a lot of ways. Yes? Yeah, just as a follow-up, uh, so um, in, ter in terms of, let's say, project management, when you uh, provide, uh, you know, you, you have that added value of, you know, drilling down into a number to take a decision. So how much time do you save by doing that as opposed to just giving, uh, you know, maps and like, can, can you drill it down to a percentage? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's kind of as, no, I can't give you a number. No, I can't give you a percentage. But what I can say is it will do what software did for manual insertion of data entry. It'll basically be that kind of saving. So it's not looking at the manual aspect, it's automating. And AI is doing the same thing, I think, in, in the way software is. Save time, save money, save effort. AI will do a similar thing. And satellite imagery is kind of, it uses both of those technologies. So I know that doesn't give you a number answer, but it's, it's very much, a, it will just keep going. And it's, it's standing on the shoulders of giants, I guess. It's it absolutely needs this background, I think, eventually. Uh, you have a did you have a follow up related to this? Can we do the follow up really quickly and then we take the All right, so uh, like this, you know, it's like a can of worms. Uh, like okay, you got the saving go <laughs> Be because let's say okay, you're saving on that then throw gen AI into the equation and things like that. So what's really your, your uh, go on. unique my, value proposition. Yeah, my, go on. We, we previously, we have a team in Pakistan and they would digitize every car in a city. We then build an algorithm and a satellite image that would detect every car in a city. What they did was not wasted because it became the training data that was inserted into a deep learning model. That model has been improved. Now we're on version six of YOLO. Um, and basically all of that data is not wasted, but we, we don't actually, we don't really need to do that again until we go to a new location. It's saved, therefore, you know, 100% of the time in any city across Europe or in certain latitude bands. We then moved to Dubai. Uh, we then collected half a day's worth of training data. We then did Dubai. We then moved to a forest location, 2,000 cars, half a day. We could then do that. And then we did it again, and now we can do the whole globe. So it's geo-specific. 
it, it is geospecific in many cases, but it's standing on the shoulders of giants. It's retraining, it's reinforced learning, it's transfer learning. And at some point you've got a model that works everywhere. And that's why I find it so exciting. And if I may say one small comment. <laughs> Natasha, so, <laughs> so it's about how people, they trust space. Uh, people trust space every day to give them the, the weather. Trust that you trust it, you open and trust it. But there are other applications where you don't trust it. And simply because people feel that space is taking over things that has been done in a different way. It's just the same hostility we have today toward AI. We think it's going to take people's job. We think AI is doing uh, 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 inaccurate stuff. It, it's maybe now, but in the future, to, uh, uh, it, it won't. So I think the perception we have to space in our area in particular, that it's it's not native to us. So by default, we don't trust it. It's not coming from our area. Hmm? Except in Kuwait. Except in Kuwait, but Kuwait have a very unique uh, experience with environmental research in the Arab world. Because Kuwait in 1991 went through the biggest environmental disaster in the Arab world, we spent six months without uh, with the pollution, which made by the invasion, and since then, they learned that environment is a national security. It's the only nation in the Arab world that take environment as a national security issue. So I think as we go, space is a tool that we will use every day in our life, and it can only make our life much better. So this, the hostility we have, it's coming from uh, the lack of development of space research in the area. And I want to come back to that, but I also want to take, uh, we had two questions, three questions. Uh, did you have? Yeah. Uh, okay, we can start in the back and then come here. Okay, cool. Um, my question was to deal with uncertainties. How does satellite data um, update its kind of trend prediction? Because as a novice of environmental science, I read, you know, James Hansen's work from 2015. And it's largely, it's like vastly different from what he's writing in 2023. Where in 2015, he's like, oh, maybe we can limit it to 1.5 degrees. In 2023, he's like, oh, we didn't take into account um, anthrop like anthropogenic aerosol emissions that uh, caused a lot of albedo. And so now we're looking at 4.8 degrees. So how do you take into account these kind of very short-term anthropogenic impacts and how they affect our data, the like analysis in the short term and how they might obscure um, trend recognition in the long term. And second question, what is the roadblock between the massive amounts of data that we're collect collecting and consolidated um, kind of policy making? Where, what could be the bridge between those two worlds? Because they seem to be very divided at this point. Good questions. So the uncertainty question, I mean, bluntly, we can get into the maths of it, but every sensor has an accuracy and you do cumulatively, <laughs> cumulative uncertainty on it and you can go through. But there's this huge issue of that modeling. And um, we I wonder, there is sure. the, the technical part of quantifying, but also what about yeah. the communication piece? Communicating yeah. uncertainty, how do you do that with your clients and customers? Yeah, sure. Sorry, I was <laughs> pulling a little bit from your question. I don't know if it had that in there. Do I give it? <laughs> so I would like to say that um, uncertainty, every data has uncertainty. So one of the biggest benefit of JPL, the place, I mean, uh, worked with for 20 years. JPL is a NASA center. I mean, this has come to the question of uncertainty. It's the smallest NASA center. It's one of 10 NASA center, but it is one of the top leading one for one reason. Because it's the strongest in system engineering, and it's the only place where the scientists do things from end to end. So for example, I would say, uh, person, of course, I, of was, course, yeah. I mean, I, that's not what, what we say at Goddard. Let's say, okay. for example, people who designed the satellite, they designed the data product, they work to do the science. So we, ha we have made, I mean, in the 11 mission I've been in, the uncertainty is quantifiable. 
it depends on the region, it depends on the sensor, it depends on the time. It's really quantifiable, so it's not, it's, not, uh, it's not something that is inaddressed. Every data product have an uncertainty analysis when it comes to the detection of the physical parameter you, you are detecting. Most of the time, people would ignore that uh, in some data analysis, but it is easy to detect. Any expert I can look and say, this is not correct. So it's not, so it's not something that you can hide. Uh, uh, and uh, it's not something we should fear also. So the best approach always to deal with the uncertainty in the data is to do the multi-sensor analysis. So you see something in optics, you go and verify it in radar, you go and verify it in hyperspectral, and then if you see this anomaly persisting, okay, then you have something, and then you go and do the, the ground validation too. Yeah. The communication piece though, mm. if we're talking about uncertainties, if we show a graph and it has temperature, there should be scenarios. There should be uncertainty clearly displayed. We look at our stick of climate change. We can, that's, that's what we should be seeing. We should be clear about the uncertainties. If you use open source data for small, tiny things, buildings even, it's going to be highly uncertain. If you use planets 50 centimeter data, you're going to make out the, there should, we should be clear about communicating uncertainty. And I think the example that you're pointing to there, just to be very, very clear, we should also have, in fact, uh, earlier today, I forget which session, I think it was the stability one, but um, our technical people who sit below decision makers, who sit below policy makers, should have dynamic uh, disagreeable, disruptive conversations with each other and say, why did you say 1.5 and now you say 4.5? Show me everything. We should have scientists in our governments who can dig into all of these details and actually be able to reliably inform and effectively visualize and communicate uncertainty. We should be peer reviewing each other. It, it really should be transparent. Um, so I hope that answers that part of the question. And just to build on that, mm. uh, that's why it, what you described, it's so important to have not everybody, but to have a subset of, uh, of people that are educated to think in multidimensional ways, to think across this, the government, you know, the policy, the politics uh, side and the, and, and the science and kind of be those translators. It's, it's a unique type of education. It's not easy to actually set something like that up. but. I think, you know, there was an education question earlier in the day as well. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's the, to address some of these, um, to be honest, I feel like for those of us that have worked in that, in that intermediate space, it's a bit lonely. It's very lonely at times because you're an outsider to everybody, right? You're like, well, you don't really fit here. You don't really fit there. But that's okay because, because you know, you see the, the usefulness of it. But I think that that's an, what you bring up is a really good point of having people that can think across the, uh, the different parts of decision making. I want to make sure we get to Natasha's question as well. Uh, so we'll come to you. Uh, oh, is this it's on, on stand? No, it's on. Um, back to groundwater. Um, we're really interested in groundwater. This might expose my ignorance, but I'm OK with that. Um, so Grace, I know, can show sort of the decreases over time in groundwater level, but we still don't know how much is left, right? Uh, as far as I know, that's still the technology to date. Um, and that makes me you know, quite nervous. I just had a conversation with a minister of water, and I, I won't say which country this was, asking about how much was left in an aquifer. And he said, only God knows, <laughs> um, which is, of course, inaccurate, but um, especially in this case, but, but also a bit jarring. Um, is there any, what else needs to happen? Is there technology that can be created to address that? Um, or do you need those people on the ground to consistently be monitoring the levels? Um, and, and I ask this question as somebody who has, you know, worked in conflict zones and humanitarian emergencies a lot where it's difficult to get that on the ground information. And this is where I see satellite data being extremely useful. To answer that because our mission is looking to map the aquifers. So the GRACE mission look to the change in, uh, uh, in the aquifer. So let's say if we have an aquifer that is untouched, it will not see it. It look to the change in the gravity made by this use. So the mission that we showed, it's using VHF sounding radar basically in easy world to X-ray the subsurface. 
to x-ray the first 50 meter and try to see the top layer only of these aquifers. So we cannot see the depth of the aquifers, we can see the extent of the aquifer. And of course, the, uh, so it, it, is, it serves as the same use of the wells. But as you know, the wells we have are located near urban area. There is no wells in the middle of the Sahara or the, uh, uh, there is no, a lot of wells in this area. Ones that have a monitoring that you can use for modeling. So it's, ve it's very sparse. So the idea of X-raying, in easy word, the subsurface, allow us to see the extent of these aquifers and how they, they, they connect between each other. So these aquifers are layer up, layer down, and they connect by faults and fracture. So the dynamic of groundwater movement is very complicated. That's why this minister, I told me, all, all, only God knows, because we don't know the physics of how this groundwater move. We don't have observations. We have wells, so we know the fact, but we don't know the mechanism very well. Four key words. <laughs> there is this digital twinning argument, which just says that as we, as we know more about the extent just laterally, just from the top, we can then understand more of the flow. We can understand what the sediments are made from. And actually, four digital twins is trying to create 4D models that understand not just 2D, which is where we are now, but then moving to a 3D model, and then a 4D model would be looking at that, but through time. Kind of takes a lot of data. So I would argue in the immediate term, we still need people on the ground a lot of the time. It kind of, it will be that way for a long time. But just like all science, we stand on the, soldier, the shoulders of multidisciplinary giants, and we just keep building, and we keep building that knowledge until we're in a place where actually we can respond, and we can have digital twins that actually do mirror um, there is this other piece of the puzzle that says, with machine learning, you can also then take all of these different layers that we've now got of data, and um, actually you can take what you see in these urban areas with this dense data set, this fieldwork, this in situ, and then you can actually try and model into these other areas. Other areas. And I would argue that's how we'll get to that place of digital twins, but um, we're, we're definitely not there yet, and there's absolutely a place for in situ observation. I would say like, we're not there yet. I agree with both of you. I think there is like a lot of aspirations towards building correlations and the models around correlations, but we need ground data. Um, we need ground data for now. So, but you asked specifically, you said you work in, in difficult um, conflict areas. Uh, we can be strategic about the way that we use different types of data. So I, I did a lot of work post, um, earthquake in Haiti, where uh, different situation, it was not, not the same types of places that, that uh, you're working in, but data was, was non-existent and the challenges were grand. So what we did it was to collect as much data as we could in the times that we could go out there, the, the, you know, the field data, and complement it with satellite data. Because neither one was giving us exactly what we needed. One could give you, it was coarser, it could give you some historical perspective, and the other uh, it could give you, you know, a little bit more specific, but it was sparse, it was not historical. But you bring those two together, you apply some of the physics-based and the AI-based kind of machine learning models, you combine all of these things, and, and you can really, you can, um, you can get better answers. So even if we're not there yet, I mean, I'm always, uh, again, like, I like technology as well, but I think sometimes people use the lack of data and technology as an excuse to not take uh, action or to uh, to be like well we don't know enough yes we do there are, we 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 can we can figure it out and I think part of that is you know wonderful to have such a diverse group here in this discussion because part of it is to uh, you know us what Malcolm Gladwell said this morning having people that don't normally talk to each other work with each other learn to talk and work with each other because there are things that you're going to, you have certain use cases, applications, that can help us advance the science and the technology applications in a way that would be useful for lots of other things. So I guess, I mean, that would be maybe one thing to, um, to, to just say that uh, this is for everybody. It's, it's not uh, data, technology, satellite, space. It's not this uh, thing that's only for those that were really good at math and science. It's really for everybody. And, and it needs to be, for it to be useful, it definitely needs to be um, very inclusive. So I think we're, we're at, the, at the end. I just wanted to give 
uh, space for each of the panelists to just say some closing remarks. Um, I would say that just as what you said, pretty much that we all need to work together. I think we're at the right time right now. I think we have a lot of knowledge, even in this room. Um, and I think that um, we should really think much more about uh, using our space assets efficiently um, because we don't end up um, actually using them on Earth. So I would encourage everyone to think much more about how can you use your, the Earth observation data that exists. Oh, so many different things we could say. Um, I think the, the one I'd really focus on is um, there are just so many applications. And I think if you're, if you're at the policy angle, it would just be thinking about how can we actually use these new technologies? How can we prove to ourselves that we can trust them and then actually move forwards with them in a standardized way? Because so many standards do exist. And it's actually taking those. Don't be scared by the complexity. Just ask people who who do know about them, and they are glad they get involved, basically. Um, so I think the, yeah, Please, let's collaborate. Let's collaborate between countries. Let's, let's collaborate with industry. Let's um, come to a solution that, that is global, basically. And I think, um, I think we need to invest more in space, simply for a very uh, important reason that our area, the climate, the physics, the environmental changes in our area are huge, are uh, and are, they are hitting everyone. And if we want to be an, an active member of the climate change community, we need to be providing data. Whoever do not provide data is not an active member of understanding global climatic change. And us relying on the others us in the region, I mean myself and others, relying on NASA, ESA, CNES, DLR, whatever space agency, to study our own region is a shame. It's really a shame. So I think we should we need more space. We need more people instructed in space. And we need people to change the, their perception for, for space that is, it is glorious. It is not. It is a human. It is essential for our survival in the desert we are in. The first time in a COP that there is a space pavilion, yeah. and this year it's in the UAE, so yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much to, to all of you. This was really fun and very insightful. Thank you all for your participation. We have 15 minutes break until the next uh, dual uh, sessions, uh, so please get some coffee and stick around and speak with the panelists too if you'd like. Thank you. Thank you.